Chapter 16, The Fire. Later on in the evening, a traveler's horse was brought in by the second hostler. And whilst he was cleaning him, a young man with a pipe in his mouth lounged into the stable to gossip. I say, Towler, said the hostler, just run up the ladder into the loft and put some hay down into this horse's rack, will you? Only lay down your pipe. All right, said the other, and went up through the trap door. And I heard him step across the floor overhead and put down the hay. James came in to look at us the last thing, and then the door was locked. I cannot say how long I had slept, nor what time in the night it was, but I woke up feeling very uncomfortable, though I hardly knew why. I got up, the air seemed all thick and choking. I heard Ginger coughing, and one of the other horses seemed very restless. It was quite dark, and I could see nothing, but the stable seemed full of smoke, and I hardly knew how to breathe. The trap door had been left open, and I thought that was the place it came through. I listened and heard a soft rushing sort of noise and a low crackling and snapping. I did not know what it was, but there was something in the sound so strange that it made me tremble all over. The other horses were now all awake. Some were pulling at their halters, others were stamping. At last, I heard steps outside and the hostler who had put up the traveler's horse burst into the stable with a lantern and began to untie the horses and try to lead them out but he seemed in such a hurry and so frightened himself that he frightened me still more. The first horse would not go with him. He tried the second and third. They too would not stir. He came to me next and tried to drag me out of the stall by force. Of course, that was no use. He tried us all by turns and then left the stable. No doubt we were very foolish, but danger seemed to be all around and there was nobody we knew to trust in and all was strange and uncertain. The fresh air that had come in through the open door made it easier to breathe, but the rushing sound overhead grew louder, and as I looked upward through the bars of my empty rack, I saw a red light flickering on the wall. Then I heard a cry of fire outside, and the old hostler quietly and quickly came in. He got one horse out and went to another, but the flames were playing round the trap door, and the roaring overhead was dreadful. The next thing I heard was James's voice, quiet and cheery as it always was. Come, my beauties, it is time for us to be off. So wake up and come along. I stood near the door, so he came to me first, patting me as he came in. Come, beauty, on with your bridle, me boy. We'll soon be out of this smother. It was on in no time. Then he took the scarf off his neck and tied it lightly over my eyes. And patting and coaxing, he led me out of the stable. Safe in the yard, he slipped the scarf off my eyes and shouted, Here, somebody, take this horse while I go back for the others. A tall, broad man stepped forward and took me and James started back into the stable. I set up a shrill whinny as I saw him go. Ginger told me afterwards that whinny was the best thing I could have done for her, for had she not heard me outside, she would never have had courage to come out. There was much confusion in the yard, the horses being got out of the other stables and the carriages and gigs being pulled out of the houses and sheds, lest the flames should spread farther. On the other side of the yard, windows were thrown up and people were shouting all sorts of things, but I kept my eyes fixed on the stable door where the smoke poured out thicker than ever and I could see flashes of red light. Presently, I heard above all the stir and din a loud, clear voice, which I knew was my master, James Howard. James Howard, are you there? There was no answer, but I heard a crash of something falling in the stable, and the next moment I gave a loud, joyful neigh, for I saw James coming through the smoke, leading Ginger with him. She was coughing violently, and he was not able to speak. My brave lad, said Master, laying his hands on his shoulder. Are you hurt? James shook his head, for he could not yet speak. I said the big man who held me. He is a brave lad and no mistake. And now, said Master, when you have got your breath, James, we'll get out of this place as quickly as we can. And we were moving towards the entry when from the marketplace there came a sound of galloping feet and loud rumbling wheels. Tis a fire engine, the fire engine, shouted two or three voices. Stand back, make way. And clattering and thundering over the stones, two horses dashed into the yard with a heavy engine behind them. The firemen leaped to the ground. There was no need to ask where the fire was. It was torching up in a great blaze from the roof. We got out as fast as we could into the broad, quiet marketplace. 
The stars were shining and except the noise behind us, all was still. Master led the way to a large hotel on the other side. And as soon as the hostler came, he said, James, I must now hasten to your mistress. I trust the horses entirely to you. Order whatever you think is needed. And with that, he was gone. The master did not run, but I never saw a mortal man walk so fast as he did that night. There was a dreadful sound before we got into our stalls. The shrieks of those poor horses that were left burning to death in the stable. It was very terrible and made both Ginger and me feel very bad. We, however, were taken in and well done by. The next morning, the master came to see how we were and to speak to James. I did not hear much for the hostler was rubbing me down, but I could see that James looked very happy and I thought the master was proud of him. Our mistress had been so much alarmed in the night that the journey was put off till the afternoon. So James had the morning on hand and went first to the inn to see about our harness and our carriage and then to hear more about the fire. When he came back, we were heard him tell the hostler about it. At first, no one could guess how the fire had been caused. But at last, a man said he saw Dick Taller go into the stable with a pipe in his mouth, and when he came out, he had not one, and went to tap for another. Then the under hostler said he had asked Dick to go up to the ladder to put down some hay, but told him to lay down his pipe first. Dick denied taking the pipe with him, but no one believed him. I remembered our John Manley's rule, never to allow a pipe in the stable, and thought it ought to be the rule everywhere. James said the roof and floor had fallen in and that only the black walls were standing. The two poor horses that could not be got out were buried under the burnt rafters and tiles.